At this point, we transition to our featured speaker and program. To introduce our speaker in a moment, I'll invite club program chair, David Fain, to the podium. I'd like to just say that uh, this, uh, this topic is one that's especially dear to me, having been a beneficiary of men uh, mentorship from a number of great, uh, great folks. And uh, so I'm listening intently. Now to introduce our speaker, David Fain. Thank you, Jimmy. Lisa Fain is the CEO of the Center for Mentoring Excellence, a Seattle-based firm founded in 1992 that helps governmental organizations, nonprofits, and companies around the world create more inclusive cultures through mentoring. She is the co-author with Dr. Lois Zachary of Bridging Differences for Better Mentoring in the forthcoming third edition of the Mentor's Guide, which is one of the definitive books on the topic of mentoring. A graduate of Northwestern University and Northwestern Law School, she honed her skills as a management side employment lawyer at a multinational law firm for over a decade before going in-house with a local public company where she built out their labor and employment practices and developed their first DEI initiatives. She is passionate about celebrating diversity and creating better workplaces. Lisa lives on Mercer Island with her husband, that would be me, and our two fabulous daughters. One will be a Rotary Exchange student uh, this coming summer. It is an honor to introduce Lisa Fain to Seattle for today. Lisa? Thank you. Well, I have to say I've spoken with groups all over the world and not yet been introduced by my husband. So it's uh, really a joy to uh, be here. And um, I feel like I'm married into Rotary. Um, well, so really happy to be here. Um, when I started uh, this work um, at Center for Mentoring Excellence uh, several years ago, uh, no one was more surprised uh, than me when I reflected on my first mentoring experience. I started my professional career as an attorney at a large law firm in Chicago, and I know Justice Ireland will probably nod her head uh, with experience here when I say that at the time there were very few senior women uh, in roles for me to, uh, to relate to. Uh, and our law firm was a little bit ahead of its time in contemplating a women's mentoring uh, program. And when I say program, I'm using air quotes here because what they call the mentoring program, I call now pair and pray, which means they paired me with a senior woman and sort of prayed that it succeeded. And their instructions to the woman was, you know, take her out to lunch. So out to lunch, we went once a month. We tried new restaurants. We... Um, had great conversation about our vacations and our families and the food we were eating. And what we never talked about was my career or my questions as a budding attorney was what uh, doubts, um, uh, curiosities, challenges I was experiencing as a budding lawyer. So when the program coordinator came by at the end of the year to ask me what I thought about the mentoring program, my feedback to her was it was delicious. It was delicious because we had great meals, but it was not developmental. And it wasn't until I had a senior attorney who took an interest in me, who saw what made me shine, who helped me develop my strengths, who gave me stretch assignments and really helped me grow, that I fully appreciated the value of mentoring. And so I wanna to talk to you before we go any further um, about what I mean when I say mentoring. I know there's a lot of seasoned folks here on this call and you all have experienced mentoring in some way. But I like to tell people that mentoring is the most promiscuously used term in leadership development because people tend to refer to lots of things as mentoring. So when we talk about mentoring, we're really talking about a relationship that has three characteristics. Mentoring foremost is a learning relationship. I like to say that learning is the purpose, the process and the product of mentoring. Mentoring is a reciprocal relationship. Mentors give and mentors get. Mentees give and mentees get. The idea of reciprocity is something that is unique to and special about the mentoring relationship. And finally, mentoring is a product of co-creation. What other professional relationship do you have where you can co-create the terms of the relationship together? Sometimes across great power distance, right? 
So when you have a relationship that's a mentoring relationship, I'm talking about those relationships that share the qualities of learning, of reciprocity, and co-creation. Here's the really special thing about mentoring. It's sort of funny math. I like to say that in mentoring, one plus one equals three. What do I mean by that? Well, in a mentoring relationship, you have a mentor, a mentee, and you have the relationship that they create together. It's a third thing in the mentoring relationship. And this is one of the reasons that mentoring is so generative because it really helps build the skills of, um, for mentees to uh, form and create a relationship and for mentors to uh, learn to co-create a relationship in a, working, uh, in a working setting. There's a little bit of a paradigm shift of mentoring. Some of you may have this image in your mind of a sage on the stage, a mentor who sits and the mentee sits at their feet and sort of partakes of all the knowledge, right? But what we know about effective mentoring is that there is a paradigm shift that's evidenced both by my own experience in years of doing this work and in lots of research about mentoring, that the role of a mentee is not as a passive learner to sit at the feet of a mentor, but really as an active learner to drive their own learning. And similarly, a mentor need not be the authority. They need not be the sage on the stage. Rather, what we know about effective mentoring is that mentors are a guide on the side where they really help facilitate that learning and help a mentee grow. And finally, this is such a shift for many people. In effective mentoring, the learning process is mentee driven. It's not about the mentor sharing uh, what it is they think the mentee needs to know. It's about the mentee identifying where there's a learning need and the mentor helping meet that need. Here's what we know about good mentoring. It rests on good conversation. And where we see, and if you think about it as a delicate balance, good conversation balances the relationship and balances the learning. Too much focus on the relationship and you end up with uh, delicious lunches like I described in my own mentoring experience. Too much focusing on the learning and you don't create authentic relationships where you can have discussions where mentees can really show up fully and authentically with their own challenges and have the learning meet their own needs. So I want to talk to you about bridging differences in mentoring relationships. And I think a little bit of clarity as we go forward, because these the terms diversity and inclusion are talked about a lot. I think the simplest way to make this distinction is the words of Andres Tapia, a colleague of mine in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. He said, diversity is the mix and inclusion is making the mix work. So let's, when we think about difference, we really want to think about creating that, inc creating inclusion. And I want to talk to you about why inclusion matters. How many of you have heard that diversity increases productivity and performance and better business results? Yeah, I'm seeing lots of nods and lots of hands up. Well, let me tell you, that's true, but it's only true sometimes. So let me tell you what I mean by that. If you think about the, the, um, the, this graph here, you can see that there are fewer teams that are multicultural teams than there are monocultural teams. Sometimes multicultural teams underperform monocultural teams, and sometimes you have multicultural teams that outperform. So what's the difference? Well, when leaders acknowledge and support cultural differences and cultural differences become then cultural differences become an asset to performance when leaders ignore or suppress cultural differences cultural differences become an obstacle to performance so the key here in making the mix work the key here in creating inclusive mentoring relationships is to acknowledge and support and celebrate those differences now let's be realists here I spent, and I'll tell you, I spent uh, 12 years as a management side employment lawyer telling people not to talk about difference in the workplace. So let me tell you that I know some of you are thinking, talk about difference, that's really uncomfortable. 
Well, Dr. Susan David, who's written a lot about emotional agility, said two brilliant things on the topic. The first thing she said is if you're looking to avoid discomfort in your working relationships, you've set a goal that only a dead person can achieve. And the second thing that she said is this, discomfort is the price of admission to a better working life. Discomfort is the price of admission to a better working life. So the idea here is to get comfortable being a little uncomfortable, to get comfortable talking about topics that we've tiptoed around for so long. And in tiptoeing around, we have um, marginalized people who've already felt marginalized in the workplace. Mentees need to be recognized and they need their differences to be acknowledged. You know, I am actually on a personal mission to eradicate this phrase, we can connect despite our differences from our parlance. I know so many of you have said it and probably have, have, have seen this and so many of you have said it. And instead to replace it with this phrase, we can connect because of our differences. I wanna get rid of we can connect despite of our differences and instead be able to say we can connect because of our differences. But the first step isn't becoming aware of others' differences. The first step is the step of self-awareness. Many of us haven't taken time to really think through our own identities. And you know we don't have time for a full uh, deep dive on this uh, today, but I wanna offer this exercise to you. Think about your own cultural identity. Think about the attributes that affect the way that you show up and the, and the way the world uh, shows up to you based on those things that can be seen above the waterline and so much more below the waterline. And when you start to think about it this way, you can really recognize this. Differences don't lie within us. Differences lie between us. Differences don't lie within us. Differences lie between us. That is, no one is inherently different in their being. We are different from one another. And when we think about it that way, we all own the responsibility to bridge differences. I wanna just say that one more time because it sounds simple, but it's really quite profound. When we think about the fact that none of us is inherently different, our differences are between us and not within us, we all can recognize the responsibility to um, bridge those, to bridge the differences between us to create better relationships. So listen, I have uh, worked with organizations all around the globe of all sizes and all kinds in all industries. And I'm seeing more and more, at least a spoken willingness to create inclusive work environments. I've heard from clients who have done lots of trainings, read lots of books, supplied lots of research, that they want to move to this land of inclusion here from the status quo. And after the books and the training, what happens is they build a lot of enthusiasm, but they go back to the day-to-day -day and they still end up in the land of status quo. But if you really wanna to move towards inclusion, it requires action and behavior. And mentoring is such a great vehicle for creating that inclusion because of the qualities of reciprocity and learning and co-creation that we talked about already because we know that differences lie between people, not within them, we all can take that action for mentoring. So here's one other piece that I wanna say before we talk about some of the how. If, you, if, if we were in a workshop together, I would prompt you to take out a piece of paper and maybe you wanna do this uh, after the session and write down your 10 most trusted people. And as you go through that list, think about the people who have, who are, make a checklist if they're similar in gender, similar in race, similar in national origin, similar in age. Think about all of those, those characteristics. And many of you will recognize that when you think about those with whom you are in proximity, um, there's a lot of similarity there. It's very hard to develop empathy and to engage in action and behavior and bridging differences when you don't have proximity to differences in your own network. 
So if I had a call to action for you from this call, it's to seek out both mentorship and mentees with some visible element of difference and begin to invite conversations about difference. Proximity helps us develop empathy. It doesn't get us all the way there, right? We still have to have conversation and relationship. But without proximity, it's very difficult to um, develop empathy. So if I were to tell you that there are three keys to career success, performance, how well you do the job, image, how an organization or an industry views you, or exposure, which is exposure to people, resources, and opportunities. So performance, how well you do your job, image, how you're viewed in an industry or organization, and exposure to people, resources, and opportunities. And I were to ask you, what percentage of success do you think that performance accounts for? What would you say? Just put it in the chat. What percentage of career success do you think that performance accounts for? I'm seeing 12%, 20%, 70 plus percent, very low, 75. Well, some of you are gonna need to hold on to those armrests on your armchair because I wanna tell you this. If you were told, like I was growing up, just be so good that people can't ignore you, then both you and I were given some misguided advice. It turns out that performance accounts for 10% of career success. Now it's table stakes. In other words, it gets you in to the pie of career success. But if you are, don't have exposure to the same people, resources, and opportunities, and you're not a well-regarded insider, you can do a much better job than somebody who has those, those attributes and still not have the same career success. So when we talk about mentorship, so often we start with focusing on performance, but really the magic of mentorship and particularly mentorship for uh, people who've been marginalized in the workplace in some way, when it's most effective is when it focuses on the I and the E, image and exposure. Now, let me say a word about image because what I'm not talking about is image in a way to fit in. What I'm talking about is helping hold up a mirror for people so they can show up authentically in the way that they want to show up in a way that might be effective, right? It's not talking about dulling the edges, right? Or trying to fit a square peg uh, in a round hole. And exposure to people, resources, and opportunities is really where the magic is at and where we can start to create more inclusive uh, work environments. Um, I wanna just say this. We can't create inclusion in our organizations until we create inclusion in our relationships. We can't create inclusion in our organizations until we create inclusion in our relationships, until we start to lean into that discomfort, until we start to create some self-awareness about our own identity and invite conversations without judgment about difference uh, in our mentoring conversations. So, I invite you all to uh, engage in those activities um, that I mentioned. Take, think about your own cultural iceberg. If you're in a mentoring relationship right now, invite your mentee to do the same and have a conversation about how some of those elements on your iceberg impact the way you might show up in your mentoring relationships. And I also have a gift for you. So, um, and I'll be providing these slides to Caroline as well. If you would like more resources on mentoring, you can go to this, um, uh, location, and there's a QR code there for you to download a copy of more resources um, on uh, mentoring as well. There's lots there to read, um, including um, uh, books, articles, some videos that may be useful that can get to much more about the how to create differences. Um, with that, um, I want to say thank you. Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know we have some questions, so I don't know whether I, I go right into that, but let me take a pause. Hey, Lisa, and thank you. Very well done. Okay, great. Yes, there are many questions, many, many questions, as a matter of fact. One, one from your husband. You'd think he would know all this by now, for goodness yes, sakes. Yes, that's right. Now I've got all these 70s and 12s to get through. Hang on. It's here somewhere. How has mentoring changed during COVID slash remote working? Good question. 
Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we've been working with global organizations for a long time. And even pre-COVID, we did um, what was then called distance mentoring. Nobody calls it distance mentoring uh, anymore. Um, but uh, it actually, um, what's interesting is in the first four months of COVID, Every organization that I worked with said, we're putting out mentoring on pause. We're putting it on hold. We're going to wait to find out what happens with the world. So um, we'll just stay tuned. And then all of a sudden, there was a frenzy for creating connection uh, in a remote world. And I'll tell you what, that frenzy kind of has been here to stay since then because people really need that connection of mentoring. Now, there is no substitute. And you all know this. Um, because you meet together every week and there's no substitute for the energy of being in a room together. But Zoom has helped enormously. But when you are forming a relationship over Zoom or you're forming a relationship, we even have, we've had clients who have been in places where there's no internet connection, so their, their mentoring relationships are by phone. Um, you have to take extra effort to create connection. And that means staying in relationship in between mentoring meetings. So make sure that you're doing all the things that you all know how to do in your, in, but don't, often don't think about in, in the context of mentoring. Send articles to one another. Follow up on a commitment that a mentee might have made in a mentoring meeting by sending a text or an email. Um, schedule a, a five-minute uh, call in between if you know that your mentee, for example, had a difficult conversation that she had to have or um, had a presentation that he'd been preparing for for a really long time. That's really, really um, critical. The other thing that is critical in doing mentoring virtually is to show up fully and authentically. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're by Zoom, always have your camera on. My virtual background notwithstanding, take those virtual backgrounds off when you're having your mentoring meetings. We know that there's kids and handymen and repair people and construction people who come into a room and yes, there's distractions, but there's a sense of intimacy that you can create by saying, wow, what a beautiful bookshelf. I love that piece of artwork. Tell me about that plant outside your window. And it, it um, helps you create the kind of connection that you might've been able to connect, might've been able to get in person um, by really creating a sense of intimacy. So have grace with the foibles uh, that happen in uh, a virtual world when there's noises and people and children and pets and all of those things, but really take the time to connect authentically in between. Um, and I will say the demand for mentoring, in my experience, has never been higher. Yeah, oh, interesting. Okay. How would you recommend we guide the conversation in our many settings to focus on inclusion uh, via mentorship in the setting? Yeah. So um, I like the, that the person who asked that question said the word guide. You don't want to jump in. Why? Because having, enough, having a conversation about difference requires a foundation of trust. It requires rapport. You know, it's like you don't want to uh, you don't want to talk to a stranger and say, "Tell me your, your feelings about healthcare reform," <laughs> right? You need to kind of dive in uh, to 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 put your toe in um, gently. So the first thing to do when you think about co-creating the relationship is to ask for permission for one another to talk about um, to talk about differences in your relationship. Say, look. I would love to share with you some challenges that I'm having, and I want to understand your experience better too. So I'm hoping that we can have conversations about that, and I can ask questions when there's something I don't understand, and you can ask questions of me. And we, I know our perspectives are going to be different, and sometimes they're going to be divergent. So let's get curious about those and give each other permission to exercise that curiosity. Yeah, I'm digging this. I like it. Here's an interesting question too. They're all interesting, but uh, I often tell prospective members, that's for this club, mentoring is one of the most important benefits of membership inside of Saddle 4. No matter what stage of life you're in, you can benefit from the wisdom of those who've gone before you. Do you have any tips for formal mentoring in a setting like a club, like our club? Yeah, um, I think formal mentoring in a club like yours can be really, really powerful. You know, some people call it a buddy system. I actually think, but if you formalize that buddy, you formalize that mentoring relationship where you set forth what the expectations are, right? And you set forth a goal. Remember that mentoring is a learning relationship. It's not just a friendship. It's not just a, hey, let's link arms. It's let's learn together. So as long as you set forth what the expectation of this mentoring 
uh, would be for the club. And pairing people, um, it's, it can be incredibly welcoming. We do this a lot with boards of directors, for example. When somebody comes on, we uh, assign them with somebody who's been on the board of directors for a longer time to have a mentoring relationship where both learn and expand their perspectives. Make sure in that um, mentoring relationship for the club that the mentor is seeking feedback from the mentee about ways to improve the club, new ideas that they might have, um, so that there really is this idea um, of reciprocity that happens in those relationships as well. It can be really, really powerful. So the next question sort of picks up on this. The next two questions kind of pick up on this. How should we facilitate and encourage mentorship opportunities among and between staff? Mm, yeah, well, I think um, may, asking staff if they want to have uh, mentors or mentees. Well, let me say, let me back up. Remember that learning is the purpose, the process, and the product of mentoring. So really encouraging a learn, uh, culture of learning is the first thing. Because where organizations often go wrong is they say, we want everybody to have a mentor. And then they don't provide the space for learning and development. And that mentorship relationship fizzles on the vine because the environment of learning isn't, isn't set. So if you are going to be encouraging relationships among staff, make sure you're setting that uh, space for learning and really making sure that you're setting that as a priority. That is thing one. Then I also fully believe that nobody should be forced into a mentoring relationship. So you wanna make sure that there's a willingness there as well. And so this providing the space and the time and the resources um, is the best way to make that happen, as long as you've also created that underlying culture of learning and development. So I'm going to continue on the thread. Why don't more organizations train mentors and mentees how to be mentors and mentees? That's kind of right in where you're talking about, right? I it's mean, not, that I could have served that question. question up. I love that question. Well, I, you know, here's, here's the thing. A lot of people think because I'm a senior person and I've been in, I've been working for a long time and I'm a good leader that I'm a good mentor. And by the way, I don't have time to have more training on how to have a mentoring relationship because the last training that I went to was either boring or ineffective um, or too didactic, right? And so I think some of it is bad experience. Some of it is a misunderstanding of what mentorship is um, and it's a miss. The most effective training for mentors and mentees is the training that allows for real experience in the training context, where mentors and mentees can begin to kick off their relationship together. Um, and there's some time for the mentors to learn and the mentees to learn. But there really is training that's necessary because mentoring is a competency. It's not just something that we necessarily know because we are uh, we've been in the particular field for a long time or we're senior in our um, field or prominent in our community. It just doesn't work that way. It's a great question. All right, so another question, what do you tell mentees who want to, to want a mentor? God, this gets confusing, particularly for people like me. Mentor, <laughs> but don't know exactly what they want to learn. That's kind of inside of what you just said too, right? I mean, yeah. what, how do you do that? Well, it's, you know, that's a great question. And it's, um, it's, it's on point because a lot of mentor mentees are discouraged from entering into mentoring relationships because they don't know exactly where it is they want to be. They don't know what the horizon looks like. It's hard, you know, for me at this stage in my career to look back to what it was like at the beginning. But if I try really hard, I can remember the fact that I didn't know what possibility was, right? I, I could see one path. Um, as opposed to recognizing many. So this is a really common thing for mentees. Effective mentors help mentees set a vision for success. So a mentor can really help the mentee by getting curious about where they're helping them identify where their strengths are, helping them using that skill of exposure that we talked about, helping to connect them to people who can help them see possibility. Um, and uh, helping them discover their strengths and discovering their, pos their, uh, their possibilities by offering your own perspective, sharing of your stories, getting curious about how your own experience might be different from them or how it resonates. But it's a really common thing that mentees are scared off of mentoring or they come in a bit paralyzed like a deer in headlights to mentoring because they don't know where they wanna be three years from now, five years from now and 10 years from now. And I just wanna say one thing about generations. 
because it's a broad sweep. But most mentees coming in are going to be in the Gen Y or Gen Z uh, generation if you're looking to, ment to mentor somebody who's quite young. And the five-year horizon that for my generation and older was the typical question, where do you see yourself five years from now, is an eternity for those folks. Think about what they've been through in the last 10 years in terms of change. And so really helping them see on the horizon can be really, really useful. All right, so I've got two minutes to ask you two questions. And the next question was exactly the thing that was on my mind. And you just started to go there, right? You're talking about the gap and you're talking about like, this is, you know, we learn from each other. One of the questions is, you know, I want a younger mentor, help us understand how to find that mentor, right? And you're sort of talking about that. I don't have to know everything. Everybody knows something. So how are we always learning from? And your first couple of slides was mentee equals mentor, mentor equals mentee, right? How do you find somebody like that then? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I love the idea. I mean, a lot of people call it reverse mentoring. I don't prefer that term. I use the term complementary mentoring, where you recognize that it's not just uh, seniority that gives you perspective, but um, there's all sorts of different perspectives. How do you find somebody? Well, the same way, the same, you know, I, I kind of... Um, I liken finding a mentor, whether it's a more junior mentor or a more senior mentor, to dating, right? In that you want to expand your network. Let people know you're looking for mentorship from somebody younger and you want to learn more about technology, different perspectives, my industry, whatever it is your own learning goal is. And um, ask people who they know who might be able to provide that. And then start to uh, have some initial conversations with people. Remember that, especially when it's kind of that... Um, uh, uh, flip in terms of seniority, you have a lot to offer to this person too when you think about the reciprocity. So it's a wonderful synergistic uh, relationship and it really is about starting to spread the word, create that, uh, create that, um, plant that seed of, about what it is that you're looking to learn and um, uh, getting the word out there. And okay. if you know, yeah, go ahead. All right, 45 seconds and I'm gonna leave you with something else. How do you help the men Tall, set the framework and boundaries in a healthy manner with the mentee. Yeah. Um, gradually, 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 suddenly. You know, they do it. You start at the beginning of the relationship and you talk about, all right, what are some of the ground rules that we want to set? What is What do we want to do about confidentiality? What are some triggers um, that might uh, get in the way? And then you revisit those. And if you're already in a mentoring relationship, don't despair. You can say, I went to the session where this lady told me that it was really good to have these conversations. And so I'd love to just talk, to see, to try this out and see if we can set some agreements. And then you revisit those occasionally in your mentoring relationship. Hey, remember, Ken, we had this conversation uh, last quarter about what some of the guardrails were going to be. How's that going? Anything we should revisit or look at uh, here? And then it becomes kind of this no-fault conversation and you build the muscle for continuing to have that dialogue. Yeah, all right, excellent. Uh, if you have a moment, would you please restate the pie percentages yes. in the chat? That would be ideal. And thank you so much for bringing your conversation to us today. Fantastic, really. I mean, if only you just knew something about mentors and mentees, that'd be really helpful. <laughs> uh, you live and breathe this, obviously. It's fantastic. Thank you, David. And someone else suggested you be here today. I think David, no, uh, Mark, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Davis. 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 Thank you, Mark. For thank that you, Mark. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Let's move on. Uh, on Lisa, so before you go, on behalf of our good friends at Harvest Against Hunger, they have, in your name, donated 600 healthy servings of food. So you can walk with that today. So that's kind of a nice thing to have around thank you. you. Thank you. All right. And now let's thank some sponsors and then we'll move on in the show as always a big thank you to liz powell with remax on market and bob alexander 